following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. So last time, in our lecture about the preparation for esoteric studies, we discussed qualities that are useful to cultivate in ourselves if we aspire to walk the path of initiation. And continuing on that same theme, I want to discuss this topic a little further, but focus on a particular aspect of that preparation that seems to be a sticking point for a lot of people, especially in the Gnostic movement. And that is the training of the mind. Now, in my experience uh, interacting with people, spiritual students tend to fall into one of two groups. The first group I'm going to call the the intellectuals. And these are people who who read everything and they they, they memorize all the teachings and they they theorize and they, they... they, they imagine, and they make all these, these unfounded extrapolations based on these, uh, what they've read with, uh, that, that have, have zero experiences underlying them. And they love to get into arguments with people to show the superiority of their theories. And they're always crafting new arguments based on ideas and, and, and classifications. I've even heard some people of this, this intellectual type argue that, for instance, the mind is the soul so that people's ideas are a, ref- are a reflection of their souls. And thus, the only way to God is through the mind, so they say. And this, this, this philosophy can lead to ideas like, your belief is what saves you. And often these people of the intellectual type have, have no real experiences. And many of them that I've, I've spoken to don't even believe that it is possible to have experiences of, of spiritual things. They don't even believe that it's possible to allow the mind to rest without thought or for consciousness to exist apart from the phenomenon of thought. And if you talk to these people about experiencing these realities firsthand, they either craft some argument for why such an experience is impossible, which always involves spouting some sort of rubbish because you're sitting there and you know this experience is possible because you've had it and they're, they're, they're telling you that, that, that it could never happen. Or they argue that even if such experiences were possible, that seeking out first-hand experience or gnosis of spiritual realities is dangerous and or arrogant And therefore, we should stick to crafting theories in our heads and wait until death to find out whether or not we're right. So forget about those sitting in Plato's cave watching the shadows dancing on the walls. These people of the intellectual type are sitting in their cave with their eyes closed tight, mumbling to themselves incoherently about what it would be like if they could only see the shadows on the walls. And Samuel Samuel Lombardo talks about these people a lot in his writings. And I suspect that, like me, he's met quite a few of them in his life, too. And he doesn't always have the nicest things to say about them. The other group of people that I'm, I'm 
that I'm going to talk about is what I'm going to call anti-intellectuals. Now, now, a large proportion of Gnostics actually fall in, into this group. And they've read what Samuel and Vior has to say about the intellectuals, and they've seen that it isn't very nice. But they're still trapped in the battle of the antitheses. They're still trapped in duality. And so rather than taking a balanced approach to the mind, they just do the opposite of the intellectuals and they shun the mind. And there's different degrees to which they, they often shun the mind. Now, in some extreme cases, they don't study at all. And they, stun, they shun all books and lectures saying that words will cloud the mind or some other malarkey. And others will will study a little, but have some rule about only being allowed to study certain books. And they make all sorts of justifications for doing this. Or they don't want to be too intellectual. Or they say, there are mistakes in these particular non-authorized books. Curiously, the people who say that rarely point out exactly what those mistakes are or, or offer any evidence regarding how big they may be or how they came to conclude that these things these mysterious things that they're worried about are, in fact, mistakes. And they just portray the danger of these mistakes as this nebulous, unknown horror. As if the student reading these books will somehow be walking peacefully so it seems like a clear and open field and unexpectedly set off a landmine that will obliterate all their hope of self-realization. I've talked to these people, and that's generally how this... How, how this uh, how these unauthorized books are characterized. And they say that the books and these words will imprison the minds of the students and stop them from investigating, investigating what their spirit draws them to. And unfortunately, this leads to a huge gap in knowledge. And it affects not only their intellectual understanding of the teachings, but also how they practice. Still others, also of the anti-intellectual type, they don't have such rigid restrictions on the intellect, but are nevertheless intellectually lazy. And they don't want to study, and they don't want to learn Kabbalah, and they only want to experience emotional highs from certain types of teachings or practices or they believe that the depth or quality of a practice directly corresponds to the amount of physical exertion or even, or even physical pain involved with that practice. And all of these types tend to justify themselves. Talking about how Samuel and Rior rallied against intellectuals and, and if they encounter someone who has a better conceptual understanding of the teachings than they do, they automatically label that person as an intellectual. I'm not sure if you've noticed, if you've, if you've been around a bit, but the word intellectual in Gnostics, in Gnostic circles tends to be kind of an insult. Now, if someone calls you an intellectual in, 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 in the public society, you're like, oh, thank you very much for the compliment. But if a Gnostic comes and tell you the, it tells you that you're an intellectual, you're like, oh, well, same to you, buddy. <laughs> Because that's the connotation that the word has, has, has come to take in, in, in Gnostic circles. And they, they ignore that Samuel and Vior warned against the dangers of, of, of too little intellect as well as the dangers of too much. And they're somehow blinded to the conspicuous fact that Samuel himself had... had Huge stores of knowledge, unfathomable amounts, amounts of knowledge in his own brain. I was, I was talking to a monk over tea a while back, and I was talking to him about the doctrine of Mo Chow um, that Samuel and Samuel Envoyor had talked about in the revolution of the dialectic. And this, this monk, who was, who was part of the, the, the Chan or the, the Zen tradition, uh, was talking to me, and he said, well, when did he write this book? And I said, oh, it was sometime in the 1970s. He said, really? Because the doctrine of Mo Chow 
hadn't come over to the West from China. It wasn't even translated into uh, uh, into into English or, or 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 Spanish until decades later. How could he have possibly known about Mo Chow back in the 1970s? Like, well, I don't know. But but some Alan Rior knew about this. He had, he had access to wells of knowledge that that. I don't even know where he got them from, but, but he did. And so he had an incredible intellectual culture. And so we have to remember in these studies that Gnosis is a path of balance. And we have to look into ourselves and notice that we have a, a predisposition to either uh, abuse or to neglect the intellect because we are inherently unbalanced. And some Alan Rior as well as many other authors in the esoteric tradition, have taught us how to use the mind in the correct way, in a way that, facil that facilitates an understanding of the doctrine and facilitates an understanding of our world and also makes us more useful to others. And so in this lecture, we'll be talking about how to do that. Now, there's two questions I want to address, like two overarching questions that I want to talk about in this lecture. The first is, what should the mind be used for? And the second is, how should we use it properly? And I'm going to start with the what. And I'll begin with a quote from a, a book by Dion Fortune called The Training and Work of an Initiate. And she says, the good occult student should have a sound general knowledge of, of natural science, history, mathematics, and philosophy. He cannot naturally have a thorough knowledge of all these subjects, but he should know their outlines. He should be familiar with the principles of all the sciences and know the methods of philosophy. Then, when he acquires special knowledge, he will be able to see it in relation to the cosmic scheme of which it forms a part, and hence will know it in a very different way from the man who perceives it apart from its environment. For the occult student, there is another reason for this framework of general information. In seeking to study by contacting the cosmic mind, he, will also, he would often gain access to a mass of miscellaneous ideas but will frequently let slip a piece of priceless information for lack of realization of its worth. Or, bewildered by an unfamiliar terminology, he may not grasp the import of what he is learning. Now, so, so she is advocating a, a, a very wide range of, of study in, in intellectual culture. And you could, you could dismiss this as saying, oh, this is, this is the unfortunate, but... Samuel Alain Rior says in, in Fundamentals of Gnostic Education, it is essential to study science, philosophy, art, and religion. However, these studies must not be entrusted to the fidelity of memory because memory is not faithful. To store knowledge within the tomb of memory is an absurdity. Yes, it is stupid to bury within the crypt of the past the knowledge that we must comprehend. We can never pronounce ourselves against studying, against wisdom, or against science. However, to store the living jewels of knowledge within the rotten grave of memory is an incongruity. So Samuel and Vior has the same prescription for what it is valuable for us to study. And he wants us to have a well-rounded and clear picture of the modern understanding of our world. And his own books and lectures, as well as the lectures that we've given at this school, draw on knowledge from all of these categories. We've talked about anatomy and biology and anthropology and astronomy and physics and mathematics and philosophy and many others all integrated into the teachings. Esoteric studies are about developing knowledge into ourselves and knowledge about nature. We are a part of nature. We live, breathe, and act within it. 
Remember that man is the microcosmos of the macrocosmos. The temple at Delphi said, man, know thyself and thou shalt know the universe and the gods. So we have to understand that the principles that act in and organize the higher planes of nature are the same principles that act in and organize us. For example, our bodies are transformers of energy with different organs performing different roles in the transformation of that energy. And the planet is similar. And it has different species performing different transformations of energy in order to, fa to facilitate the life of the whole ecosystem of the planet. Now, most organisms on the planet may be influenced by the will of the planet, but they also have self-will and are guided by other organizing principles. Consider yourselves. We, uh, intellectual animals, are not blind slaves of the will of the planet. We have free will to a degree, and we have a type of individuality. Now, you may not know this, but the human body is exactly the same way. Over 90% of the cells in your body do not actually belong to your body. They don't have your DNA. Over 90% of the cells in the human body are actually independent bacteria. And so when you look at a human body, you're, not, you're actually not looking at this, this, this one unified structure. You're really looking at what is actually a giant mass of bacteria. And only about 10% of that is actually, actually is the human body. And so most of the cells in your body are actually these, these independent organisms working to facilitate the ecosystem of your body. Just the way it works on the planet. And so this is just an example of how these principles that, 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 that work on the macrocosm also work with us on the microcosm, and it goes down further still. Consider also how many lectures we've given associating the 12 apostles with the, with the organs of the body. These are a lot easier to understand if you actually know what those organs do. And so we can appreciate these relationships and organizing principles better if we have an understanding of the natural world. Now, notice in this quote that Samuel and Vior did not mention anything about believing everything that they tell us. Pay very close attention to the middle paragraph here, which is about comprehension. Now, there's often a disparity between what is taught in esotericism and what is taught in the mainstream science. And many people who come to, the, uh, to, to, to esoteric studies also often have kind of a condescending view of what, what materialistic scientists talk about. Now, this is related to the difference between knowing what to think and knowing how to think. And Samuel talks about this uh, in Fundamental Education. He says, it is indispensable that teachers teach their students how to think. Teachers must comprehend the necessity of teaching their students the path of analysis, meditation, and comprehension. A comprehensive person must never accept anything in a dogmatic way. It is essential to first investigate, comprehend, and inquire before accepting. In other words, we state that instead of accepting, it is necessary to investigate, analyze, meditate, and comprehend. Thus, when comprehension is complete, acceptance is irrelevant. And so when I stand up in front of you and I say, study science, I don't mean to allow your mind to become trapped inside the dogmas of science or within their phony belief systems. Study philosophy does not mean to entangle your mind in the, in the many intellectual absurdities of people from Greece who call themselves philosophers. This is not about memorizing facts. The actual what of science is always changing. 
I remember a friend of mine who was, um, who was telling me how his father, when he was in school, this was before the space age, his father t- had to take a physics class, and in that physics class, he had to memorize a proof for why it was impossible to escape the gravitational pull of the Earth. And so during this time, during the, the, early, the early 20th century, they actually believed, and they thought they had proven mathematically, that reaching into space was, was actually physically impossible. And then we went and did it. And we have companies now that are, that are making, making a business out of, out of sending people into space. And this is one example of how just the actual what of science, the actual teachings of science are, keep changing throughout history. And I guarantee you that, that what, the, what science believes in 20 years is not what, is not what they believe today. And so, when we talk about studying science, we're not talking about studying the, the, memorizing their dogmas or, or, or their theories. But rather, this is about understanding the principles that underlie these discoveries. We want to know the underpinnings of the scientific principles. We want to understand, when a new study comes out, how they arrive at their conclusions and what evidence supports them, and how do those principles extend or relate to other realms, and what assumptions did they make when they derived these principles and theories, and what sort of exceptions might there be, and how can you relate those principles to your own life with concrete examples. This is a process of private inquiry, of questioning, of playing around with the principles and ideas in different ways, of knowing how to apply logic and how to analyze conclusions. This is about critical thinking and creativity. This is about the overall process of utilizing the mind, which involves not only analyzing intellectual principles, but also knowing how to balance the energy of the mind which involves knowing how to pay attention and knowing when to stop so that we don't overuse the intellect. This idea of knowing how to think is also about allowing your mind to rest in silence and contemplating the principles that we're learning in meditation. And so this study of science is not about knowing the what so much as understanding the evidence that they have, perceiving that the theories and the explanations that they have for this evidence are not always the, um, are never going to be, it's rather it's better to say, the truth of the matter. But learning how to analyze their conclusions and understand them in the context of our, of our own knowledge and our own gnosis, and also within the context of, of, the, of, the, wider, uh, of the wider esoteric tradition. Now, this process of knowing of how to think and how to utilize the mind also relates to the process of developing another type of thought, which I want to talk about here. The unfortunate says, it must be remembered that there are two distinct levels of the mind, the region of concrete thought and the region of abstract thought, and each of these requires a culture. To a man who is accustomed to think in nothing but concrete terms, the abstract appears meaningless when he first comes in contact with it. Its terms evoke no corresponding image in his consciousness, but are just so many words to him. 
And it is necessary to habituate the mind to think in ideas instead of images. And one of, the, one of the readiest ways to do this is the study of algebra. For here, the mind is forced into an elementary type of abstract thought and acquires the habit of thinking of proportions apart from things. From this point, advance may be made to the study of philosophy and metaphysics, etc. Now, I'm not going to tell you to go out and study algebra if you haven't done it already. However, even some of you are recommended an elementary study of mathematics. He said the world of intuition is the world of mathematics. The Gnostic who wants to elevate himself to the world of intuition must be a mathematician or at least have notions of arithmetic. Mathematical formulae give us intuitive knowledge. And so however you do it, it's necessary to, to cultivate an abstract mind. To be able to think in terms of, of principles and archetypes. And we, you, you'll find that, that we talk about Kabbalah a lot in this school. And Kabbalah deals a lot with, 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 with principles and archetypes. And a lot of people have, have trouble understanding Kabbalah because they're not accustomed to thinking in this abstract way. Now, if you don't know what Kabbalah is, it comes from the Hebrew term kabel, which means to, to receive. And Samuel Vior explains it. He says, Kabbalah is the basis in order to understand the knowledge of the, inter the language of the internal worlds. And Samuel wrote many books on Kabbalah, so he obviously felt it was important. And we've talked about it a lot in, in, in the, the lectures at this school. And Samuel railed against the dangers of, of, of the intellectual Kabbalists. He wanted us to have an intuitive understanding of what the Kabbalah is. And yet, despite the emphasis on Kabbalah found in the Gnostic teachings, as well as the teachings of every religion, just open up any scripture in the, in the, in the world and you'll, you'll see Kabbalah there, many students still avoid studying the Kabbalah or find it too difficult. And they justify themselves with excuses like the ones we talked about at the beginning of the lecture, saying, oh, this is too intellectual or, or something like that. And so part of the difficulty with the, study of, with the study of the Kabbalah is that we have mental habits that are obstacles to the study of this knowledge. So I wanted to take a few minutes today to talk about these mental habits and how we can resolve them. The first thing I want to emphasize is that we have to train our mind to be flexible. We have this tendency, natural in the intellect, towards a, a dualistic frame of thinking. The mind wants to say this, therefore not that, or X, therefore not Y. And we want to classify things into these, these, these rigid boxes. And we do this with everything. We do this with, with animals and, and plants and minerals. And scientists have this, this, this definition of a, of, of a species that involves, that involves breeding. So it's like, oh, look, two species, that, uh, two separate species cannot, uh, uh, cannot create offspring together. And yet, sometimes we see cases where, 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 where these lines are blurred and two, and, and two species can breed with one another. And we classify elements, too, into this periodic table. But even at the atomic level, not all elements of, of, a, of a particular, not all atoms of a particular element are the same. There are these things called isotopes where, where, where we can see that even within, within an, element, an, an elemental category, the, the atoms have, have, have different structures and, and properties and, and, and weights. People also do this with, with, with Bible interpretations. 
we periodically have, have, have someone come up and, uh, and raise the need uh, for, a, for a Gnostic Bible with brackets. Like we like to put, whatever we explain a, we explain a scripture, I always put these brackets in where we, we write the secret meaning and everyone's always, uh, always astounded by, by the meanings that we put in the brackets. However, with regards to this, I don't really think it's possible to actually go through the Bible and put brackets into every single chapter and verse. The symbols have a, have a, have a depth and a beauty that would be destroyed if we tried to take all of that and put it into our minds. I'm always astounded when, I'm, when, I, when I read many biblical symbols and I, I'm contemplating these symbols and I'm, I'm perceiving them from so many different angles. And we're seeing all these different meanings into this, this, one, this one verse. And it would be impossible to encapsulate that within a single explanation. And I'll give you an example for the, the weakness that there is in trying to Take, take these, these, biblical, these biblical scriptures and, um, and assign them in, into boxes and classifications. Now, a while back, one of the instructors at this school, he, 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 he was talking about John the Baptist. And he, he, he gave an explanation of, of the decapitation of John the Baptist as, as being related to the, the decapitation of the ego. It's a good explanation. Some Ellen Viewer also talks about the decapitation of John the Baptist. And he gives an explanation of, of the decapitation of John the Baptist being related to the lust of King Herod. Completely different. So does that mean that the, 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 instruct, the, the, the instructor was right and Samuel Ellen Viewer was wrong, or vice versa? No. Both of those are accurate readings into that story. Two seemingly contradictory views of the story. But they're all contained within the archetypes of John the Baptist. Another example for this, think about the word Bereshith, the first letter, the, the first word of the Bible in the beginning. We've given so many explanations for the meaning of Bereshit in this school. I've lost count of how, how, <laughs> how many times we've talked about Bereshit. And they're all valid. They're all true on a certain level. And so we can't take the symbolism of the Bible and, and classify it into these boxes. We can't We can't, do, we, we can't sub, subject it to the, the dualistic processes of the intellect. Part of, part of seeing these things intuitively is, is recognizing the intuitive relationships that give rise to all of these explanations. And seeing how they are formed. And understanding on, 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 on what level each of these explanations, each of these understandings pertain. Reality, especially spiritual reality, does not always fit into the boxes that our mind would like it to fit in. Now in the physical world, the separation between different things is more pronounced. It's clear that I am different from you because there's space between us. 
And our brain, our intellect, evolved within this, this material, physical world and, and is designed to handle input from this world. But the internal worlds, such as the mental world, those distinctions become less pronounced. And the division between you and me is not as clear as it is in the physical world. Think about the, the, uh, the process of co-discovery. It's been documented umpty ump times that many times a, a, a great discovery in, in science or, or, or mathematics is discovered by two different people in two different places at exactly the same time. Within, within weeks of one another, or even less. Why, could, why, why, why would this happen? It's, it's because there, 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 there's a connection in the mental world. Even though these, these, these people on, on other sides of the globe can't communicate with each other physically and have no way of interacting with one another, it's... There's an abundance of evidence for showing that there is that there is some sort of interaction going on here that's happening in the internal worlds. And so these distinctions, the separation between us is 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 not as clear as it is in, in, in the in the physical world. We also like to put ourselves into boxes with labels. And we say, like, this guy is an intellectual, and this guy is a politician, and this guy is very lustful, and this guy is very greedy. But, but the ego doesn't really work like that. We like to classify the ego into pride and anger and lust and, and, and envy because it's, it's, it's useful for, for highlighting the aspects of ourselves that we need to pay attention to. But at least I found, when looking into the depths of my ego, that labels just fail me. I've looked at certain egos, and I'm like, is this lust? Is this pride? Is this greed? And all those things seem to be molded together into this one giant monster. And we want to put a, put a, a label on these things, but we, 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 we go down to the depths and these, these, the, these distinctions just, just, just fail. And all the, 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 the dividing line between all these, these, these different egotistical tendencies becomes more and more unclear the further down you go. And so the, the scriptures need to teach with archetypes. They need to teach with, with, with symbols that have, that have depths and depths and depths. Because they're trying to teach us about ourselves. And we do not f fit into the rigid classifications that we would like to believe that we fit into. We too have depths and depths and depths. And so this is more than a lesson about how to understand lectures like the lecture about the two serpents that we, that we listened to last week. This is a lesson about how do we understand reality? How do we understand ourselves? This is a lesson about gnosis and how to stop taking gnosis and trying to fit it into this rigid set of concepts and ideas. I'm going to tell you a secret about concepts. Concepts, intellectual thoughts, are always wrong. Reality never conforms to the ideas that we have in our heads. There's, there's, there's a saying among, among scientists, there's, there's a, all theories are wrong, but some theories are more wrong than others. <laughs> Stephen Hawking has a story about this in, the, in, the, in his book, a, a Brief History of Time, 
work. He's the, um, there's this, there's a stro- an astronomer who's, who's giving a lecture about the solar system and how the, the planets revolve around the sun. And, 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 and that's, a, that's a concept, that's, that's, a, that's a model that we, we find very useful. And, and, and many people think that it's true, but remember that it's a concept. And this, um, this old lady is, is sitting in the audience, and uh, she comes up to the astronomer and she says, well, that was, that was a very entertaining lecture. Too bad it's all wrong. And the astronomer is looking at this old lady, and he's, he's, uh, he's kind of amused by this. He thinks like, oh, oh here's this old lady. She, she, she's clueless. And he, and he says, okay, uh, ma'am. If, if my lecture about, about the solar system was wrong, why don't, why don't you tell me what, what reality actually is? And she says, well, sir, what the world actually is, it's, 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 a, it's a giant plate sitting on the back of a, of a big turtle. And the astronomer is looking at her. And uh, he thinks it's going to be funny, right? And he says, okay, ma'am. If the whole world is a big plate and sitting on top of a, sitting on top of a giant turtle, uh, what's the turtle standing on? The lady is unfazed. She says, "Ah, you're very clever, young man, but it's turtles all the way down." <laughs> and so, it's an illustration of this story that, that all theories are wrong, but. We can tell that some theories are more wrong than others. Uh, it's, it's, up, it's up to your personal preference which one of those, those two theories, the, uh, the, the, the earth revolving around the sun or, or the, the infinite stack of, of, of turtles, which you find to be more plausible. But it's important, uh, uh, so I'm not going to pass judgment on either of those two theories, but uh, I, I, I do have a preference myself. Um, but each of those theories has, has its flaws. Each of those theories is, is, is incomplete um, on, on a particular level. But we forget this all the time. Now consider the Gnostic teachings. We learn all these concepts in, 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 in our Gnostic studies which, are, which are, are very useful and very good. But then we start to think, maybe these concepts are truth. And then we get into arguments with people, arguing for our version of the truth over the years. And, and then we become trapped in this illusion again that truth is a concept, that it's a statement, that it's an idea that you can hold in your mind. But I'm going to tell you another secret. Nature and the spirit are far more complex than anything that we describe in, in, the, in our lectures here. Nothing is ever as simple as we make it sound. There is an enormous amount of depth and complexity to reality. So remember that when you study these teachings. The other thing we need to remember about the mind is that we cannot use the mind to orient ourselves in these teachings. We need to understand the weaknesses of our own mind if we hope to use it properly. And that's, that involves being cognizant of how we receive our mental states from external stimuli. I've known a lot of people who were very interested in, the, in, 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 in gnosis, and very, very interested in, 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 in studying these teachings and, and practicing but they didn't know how to manage their mind. And so they would leave for many months and get involved with, uh, 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 with people who are hostile to these teachings or, or submerge themselves in, in, an, in an environment. Uh, there are many environments like this in the world that are, that are, that are just completely materialistic and, 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 and atheistic. And... and even though we, we like to say, oh, I'm, I'm in charge of my mind and all my thoughts come from me. 
little by little, hearing the same thing over and over. Oh, those experiences are all illusions. There's no such thing as God. It can start to erode away at, at the concepts that we have in our mind. We, we, we start to think, oh, maybe these people are right. And so that this, this relates to something I've talked about before, which is the importance of the Sangha, the spiritual community, which is one of the three jewels in Buddhism. And making sure that you, you cultivate time with members of a spiritual community who are going to, who are going to help you to to soothe your doubts and, and to, to, to help you give energy for your practice and will help fortify your practice against, uh, against the, 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 the assaults from the outside world. It's important to remember that it's impossible for the mind alone to determine what truth is. And so if your center of gravity is in your mind and you're basing your, um, your, 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 basing your foundation for, these, for, these, uh, for this practice in your mind, it's eventually going to get eroded away. Many philosophers and theologians try to come up with a, a, a perfect and unassailable explanation for why God exists or, or, or doesn't exist. But such an explanation simply doesn't exist. Some Alan Vior said many times that for every thesis, there is an antithesis. There's always an explanation for the, the, complete, opposite, uh, the complete opposite point of view that is, that is as good or better than, 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 than the one that you have. And so if your center of gravity is in your mind, you're, you're, you're going to keep getting assailed by these, these, these other explanations that are going to make your, make your mind become, uh, be, become weak and, 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 and loosen your concepts. So there is no perfect argument in the realm of the intellect. Not even in the realm of mathematics. We, we generally think of mathematics as being the most pure form of, of intellectual understanding. But even in mathematics, they have this theorem, a set of theorems actually called Goodell's incompleteness theorems, that prove, actually prove, that no system, that no system, no axiomatic system that's a system based on, on, on principles that we assume to be true can prove the truth of itself. What that means is that even mathematics cannot determine what truth is. Even mathematics cannot say absolutely we can we, we can determine with 100% certainty that, that, that X is true. And people ask me a lot, why are you involved in these Gnostic studies? Why do you place such a high value on the spiritual work? Why do you do all these practices? And they want an explanation. They want a reason. Because they're expecting that this is a practice like many other things that we do in life that has its foundation in the mind. They assume that I, 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 I do this as a, as a calculated decision, that I sat down one day and that I weighed the pros and the cons and I said, oh, I'll add up everything and, and this, this gnosis thing seems like a good idea, I'm going to do it. Now, I can give you many, many reasons why this work is valuable and why it has meaning and importance for me. But none of those reasons are the real reason why I do this. When I'm honest with myself, I don't know the real reason. 
It's something deep, deep within me, welling up from within the depths of my soul. And I trust that more than I trust any intellectual justification for why this work is important. A foundation for the work is not in the intellect. It's not in a system of, of, of reasons or explanations, but it's in that. Something deep, deep within the human person. Now, in relation to that topic, <clears throat> we should never try to dominate the minds of others. Because we tend to think, again, with this bias towards believing that, that everything is, is, is related to the mind, oh, if I just explain this the right way, and this person would be convinced, and then they would walk on the right path. And if this is a tempting illusion, especially for those of us who teach, and I do not mean to discount the value of expressing the teachings in a way that is both clear and beautiful. Accurate and helpful teachings are extremely important. However, like I've just finished saying, and I'll say it again, if what really drives us in this work is our mind, we will fail. The mind does not have the capacity to navigate this path on its own. The impetus must come from within, and it has to be deeper than thought and deeper than feeling. Because thought and feeling will come and go. Your ideas will change. Feelings move in waves. Sometimes you'll feel very enthusiastic. And sometimes you'll, 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 you'll feel lethargic or, or, or defeated. And, and so if, you, if your foundation is on these things that, 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 that are constantly in flux, then your, your, your practice, your work is constantly going to be in flux. Self-realization is the work of the spirit. And it must be the spirit that drives us. And so even if you do manage to convince someone intellectually, if the spirit is not pushing them, then sooner or later they're going to slip away. There are just too many negative influences in this world for there to be hope of us maintaining a particular mental state conducive to the practice unless either we have a lot of dharma to influence us from, uh, to, to, to insulate us from those influences or we are working to consciously manage the mind from a different center which is also related to having a lot of dharma. And so we should respect people's freedom of thought and we shouldn't try to impose our ideas on others even when it is so clear that they are oh so very, very, very wrong. Now there is another mental habit that we have which greatly impedes our understanding. And this is not knowing how to listen. Someone else says in fundamental education, when a teacher or lecturer speaks, the audience seems to be very attentive, as if they were following in detail every word of the speaker. And everything indicates that they are listening, that they are in a state of alertness. Nevertheless, within the psychological depth of each individual, there is a secretary that translates every word of the speaker. That secretary is the I, the myself, the self-willed. The infamous job of that secretary consists in misinterpreting, in mistranslating the words of the speaker. Yes, the I translates in accordance with its prejudices, preconceptions, fears, pride, anxieties, ideas, memories, etc. Students in their school or the individuals who as a group constitute the auditorium do not really listen to the speaker. They listen to themselves. They listen to their own ego, to their beloved Machiavellian ego that is not willing to accept what is real, true, and essential. Have you ever spoken to someone and they really seem to be listening to you? 
And then they open their mouths to respond to you, and it's clear that they really didn't hear anything that you just said. It's kind of like that. And we all do this to a degree. We listen to someone, and then we have this separate narration going on in our heads. And or we often we're, we're sitting there trying to translate what they're saying into our own words and experiences and prejudices and memories. Or worse, we're not listening at all. We're just sitting there to waiting to respond with something that's itching in our own, in our own brains. Or, or worse still, we don't even allow the person to finish speaking. And we just rudely interrupt them with some sort of asinine objection without even bothering to understand what they were trying to communicate. And this behavior isn't even uncommon in our society. It happens on TV all the time, all these interviews that they do. But when we're trying to learn something new, we have to have our minds clear and empty so that we're open to receiving the new. Only in a state of alert novelty with a spontaneous mind free from the burden of the past in a state of complete receptivity can we listen without the intervention of that terrible ill-omened secretary, namely the I, the myself, the self-willed, the ego. When the mind is conditioned by memory, it only repeats what it has accumulated. A mind conditioned by the experiences of so many yesterdays can only see the presence through the cloudy lens of the past. If we want to know how to listen, if we want to learn how to listen so that we can discover the new, we must live in accordance with the philosophy of momentariness. Yes, it is essential to live from moment to moment without the preoccupations of the past and without projections of the future. That's Samuel and Vior in Fundamentals of Gnostic Education. This means listening while allowing our mind to be still. Remember that kabel means to receive, so allow your mind to be receptive. And allow your brain to rest. And you'll find that if you're not furiously trying to intellectualize all the concepts that you're exposed to during the lectures, like the lecture that we had last week, they become much less taxing and much, much easier to understand. Over-engaging and misusing the intellect which often happens when we're listening to someone because we're often trying to sit in there trying to intellectualize what they say, can lead to all sorts of problems related to psychological disintegration. Remember that gnosis is the path of balance. And walking on the path of balance means properly managing the energies in relation to all three of our brains, the motor instinctive sexual brain, the emotional brain, and the intellectual brain, and understanding the relationship between those centers. I want to talk about this re with regards to the relationship. The vice of masturbation, Samuel and Vior says, totally ruins the cerebral potency. It is essential to understand that an intimate relationship exists between the semen and the brain. Thus, it is necessary to cerebrally nourish the semen and also necessary to seminally nourish the brain. The brain is seminally nourished by the transmutation of the sexual energy, by the sublimation of the sexual energy, by transforming it into cerebral potency. Thus, sexual transmutation is the way to cere cerebrally nourish the semen and to seminally nourish the brain. And so part of developing this balance is not just using all the centers equally, but using the centers in a way that we're not going to damage them through our misuse of the other centers. And so 
desire in the mind leads to leads to a corruption of of the of, of the sexual energy which in turn leads to further desire in the mind and so all the centers get thrown into into imbalance this path of balance also relates to knowing how to use the right center for the right purpose And so, many times, we're, we're, we're students, they try, to, they try to shun the intellect, or they, they, or they have a, a predisposition, predisposition towards shunning the emotions. But the intellect has things that it's good at. The heart has things that it's good at. And so, we need to recognize what is the intellect supposed to be used for? What is it good at? And then use it for that, use it for that purpose. Use a hammer to hammer a nail and use a screwdriver to, to, to screw in a screw. The centers are tools that we have to use. And part of walking the path of balance is, is learning what the proper tools are for, uh, for, for the proper problems. One example of this is, is knowing how to cultivate the mind for the use in a career. Something of yours says in fundamental education, every student must guide himself through the, voca the vocational path and study in depth all those theories that are related to his vocation. Studies and the intellect do not harm anyone. Nevertheless, we must not abuse the intellect. We need to study to avoid abusing the mind. Whoever wants to study the theories from different vocations, whoever wants to harm others with the intellect, whoever exercises violence against the neighbor's mind, etc., abuses the mind. It is necessary to study vocational subjects and spiritual subjects in order to have an equilibrated mind. It is essential to arrive at the intellectual synthesis and the spiritual synthesis, if indeed what we want is an equilibrated mind. And so you could be thinking here, because uh, he's talking about don't study theories from other vocations, while earlier on in this lecture, and even in the earlier on in this, this, this same book, Samuel and Rior is saying, oh, have a, have a broad knowledge of science and philosophy and religion and art. But remember what we, what we said at the beginning. We don't need to study in depth to the degree that uh, uh, as a scientist uh, or, 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 or a mathematician would know science and mathematics in order to have a foundational understanding of science and mathematics. I, for instance, am, a, am a, a big fan of astronomy. I've always loved astronomy since I was, was, was very, very small. And so, I have a pretty good understanding of, of, of the theories and, 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 and the concepts that are used in, in, in modern astronomy. However, even though I, I have more astronomical learning than, than, than most lay people, I have nowhere near the kind of understanding of the astronomical models that are, that are required in order to be an astronomer. That takes years. It's, it's like four or five years of, of, of intense study and, and, and research. And that's, that's not something that I have. But I know the basics of astronomy. I know the basics of, of, of physics and biology. And so... Not studying theories from other vocations does not preclude you from, from, from just looking at the foundations and having a, 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 general, a general understanding of knowledge in the world. I want to show you another quote, to, uh, because there's, there's a lot going on here. To put this, this, uh, this quote in, in, in context... 
Because he says here, it is necessary to study vocational subjects and spiritual subjects in order to have an equilibrated mind. And he says elsewhere in fundamental education, intellectual knowledge without the spiritual being very well developed produces intellectual confusion, perversity, pride, etc. During the Second World War, he says, thousands of scientists who were devoid of any spiritual element committed terrible crimes in the name of science and humanity with the purpose of executing scientific experiments. We need to develop a powerful intellectual culture. Yet, this must be terrifically equilibrated with a true cognizant spirituality. So intellectual knowledge needs to be understood in its context. We don't just study for the heck of it just for the sake of accumulating more theories. Intellectual knowledge should never be its own end. We, 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 we cultivate this knowledge in order to make ourselves useful to our fellow man and useful for the spirit, useful for our inner God. I see many lines of research nowadays where scientists are, are trying to discover things that it's, it's obvious are just going to get abused, like building bigger bombs or, or this new technology that they're working on now that they, they, where they're, they're figuring out how to, how to read people's minds. There's actually a lot of research going into this, 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 this uh, new technology to, to, to read people's minds. And they give all these explanations for why this is, uh, why this is valuable. Uh, like, oh, we, 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 we won't have to do dating anymore. We'll just, just hook you up to a, hook to a machine. And we'll figure out whether you're compatible with so-and-so person or, or, or whatnot. And a lot of times, the scientists aren't even, um, aren't even thinking about the practical application of this thing. They're just, they're just pursuing this line of research because they're, they're, they're interested in, uh, in developing this knowledge. When it's clear to anyone with an IQ over two. If, when, they actu when they actually develop this technology, and they are going to develop this technology, that, that it's only going to get abused and used by people with power to, uh, to, to hurt people. And, and but they're pursuing this line of knowledge anyways because it's not being driven by the spirit. And others, they, they seek knowledge for unscrupulous ends. I remember reading a while back in, in the Stanford Alumni Magazine about the, um, the pharmaceutical industry and the state of, uh, the state of uh, clinical trials in the pharmaceutical industry. And it's something to remember about, the, uh, about this industry is that there's an, uh, a very high economic incentive to, um, to do these drug tests and find out that the drug really, really works. And it's much better, better than the placebo and has no side effects and whatnot. And so there's this incentive, a financial incentive, to get positive results from, the, from these clinical trials. And what this article is talking about is it looked at a lot of these trials for, for, the, for the pharmaceutical industry and found out that wherever there was an incentive to get positive results in favor of the drug, that very, very often the, the investigator conducting the research would use really shoddy statistical methods that were not valid in the context of that trial in order to ensure that he got the results that he wanted to get. And so the results of the trial were completely invalid. And yet, here are these people um, with, 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 with very high qualifications and, and, and which our society puts their, our trust into in order to uh, ensure that the, 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 dr the drugs that we're using are, are, are safe and effective. And they're shirking on this duty for for money. And, and thousands or even millions of people are getting hurt because they're, they're, 
they're giving the, 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 the A-OK -okay stamp to these drugs that, re that really are harmful or ineffective. Because they're, they're, trying to, they're, they're trying to make money for themselves or, 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 or for their company. And they found that this, uh, this was happening not only in, um, in studies that were being run by the pharmaceutical companies themselves, but also in studies that were being run by independent academics at universities. Because there's also an incentive for them to get positive results in these kinds of studies. And so this is just an example of, of the harm that can be caused when the, the intellect is, is developed and, and utilized completely divorced from the spirit. Another aspect of this quote that I wanted to talk about. He says at the end here, is an essential to arrive at the intellectual synthesis and at the spiritual synthesis if indeed what we want is an equilibrated mind. So what does he mean by synthesis here? In his book, The Social Transformation of Humanity, he, exp he, he explains, the truth is not found in conceptual dualism. If we want to find the truth, we must go beyond the polarity of the mind. We need to reach the great synthesis. Yet, the synthesis is beyond the opposites of philosophy. In the synthesis can be found true peace, and only in the synthesis. And so, what he's saying, to, e to equilibrate our mind, we need to reach beyond duality, in both the realm of the intellect and the realm of the spirit. We must be free from the battle of the opposites. And therein lies the equilibrium. And so we started talking about duality, and, and here we are ending with a discussion of, of duality. We talked a lot about the mind today and, and how to use it properly. And obviously this is a very deep topic, so we, we don't hope to cover everything that there is to say about it. But we do hope that for those of you just starting out, that you were able to find something useful in this lecture that will help you as you prepare yourself to dive into Gnosis. But remember what I've said many times during the course of the past hour, Gnosis is a path of balance. So to properly develop ourselves, we must work with the heart and the body as well as with the mind. We are interested in the complete development of the human being not just in one of his centers. And if you found what you heard today to be overwhelming or intimidating, whenever we're in algebra, don't be afraid. It's not necessary to be an expert in science or mathematics to fully experience the reality of the divine light. All of us have different capacities, and so we all have to work starting where we are and with what God has given us. Do you have any questions? Yes. Um, so you use the, the term mind a lot in your lecture. Yeah. When you use the word mind, you're referring to intellectual thinking, then, right? The process of thinking. Um, not always. Mind is a little, is a little broader than that. Because um, you said that, that the mind... <coughs> Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, in that context, yes, I mean mind is in terms of the intellect. I used mind uh, a little loosely in this lecture. Um, in Buddhist philosophy, mind is used uh, uh, a little differently than, than, we're, than we're using it here. So that's just, just, just a, it's a semantic difference. Um, the, it's the same, the same word for use, use for different things, but yeah. The, the, the mind in Buddhism is a lot, is a lot broader than, than the, the context I'm using it for here. Yes? Yeah. And that's the more we talk about how um, you know, we have a library of books. 
Mm-hmm. Even some of them not really read, right? And you know, we get what we need at a certain time. You know, it's like almost intuition when you talk about. It, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, I bet some of you didn't learn about mocha about reading it in a book. Um, with regards to with regards to being uh, Ill- illiterate masters, like, like some of you said that Little Antes was illiterate. But even even if a master is, is illiterate, it doesn't mean that they're dumb. It doesn't mean that they don't have an understanding of 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 nature and the world. It's just that they didn't get that understanding through reading. And so, like, like, uh, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing about these, about this path that requires you to, um, that requires you to be literate. It can be helpful to be literate, but it's not required. Like, uh, several lectures ago in, in our, our, our talk about the introduction to awareness, we, uh, we had this quote from Padma Sambhava that said, even a cowherd, a, s- a simple person with, with, with no uh, intellectual training at all, can experience the realities, uh, can experience the great reality, pure, uninhibited, uh, the pure, un- uninhibited light, like we're talking about here in this, in this, in this, uh, in this discussion. And so... <clears throat> You can have an experience of that reality, and many people do, without knowing how to conceptualize it. And if you're at the level where you can, uh, you can cultivate the mind without, going, w- w- without uh, reading things on the physical world, then... You can still develop that kind of uh, that kind of uh, intellectual culture and understanding even without being illiterate, right? And Samuel and Vior also talked about those who um, who are mystics but don't have uh, any sort of um, any sort of intellectual understanding of. Uh, how, how these uh, how these teachings work, and he said that um, even though these people uh, have these have experiences, they're not very useful in terms of of helping their fellow man, because there's no way for them to uh, to communicate their experiences in a, in, a, in a clear and lucid way to uh, to, to others and, and to teach others properly how to how to develop their practice and so um, we still encourage the development of an intellectual culture in order to 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 make ourselves useful to useful to others and to be able to view our experiences in the proper context but if 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 you're a master who who has that that understanding inherently then then all the more power to you To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy.